Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to help you discover the lore hidden within your Hearthstone deck. In our last full episode, we looked at the Rogue's Grand Tournament legendary, the Traitor King Anubarak. This time, we'll be looking at a man who, once infamous, would eventually become the leader of one of the most influential organisations on the face of Azeroth, the mage legendary, Ronin. The art of the card is by the artist duo Zoltan Boros and Gabor Zudsky, whose names I'm sure I just butchered. The two Hungarians formed a friendship in high school and started collaborating on artworks. The two friends are influenced and inspired by each other, carefully listening to one another's criticisms and take advantage of each other's skills to create their work. This method has clearly been successful, as they have produced art for Dungeons & Dragons, Magic the Gathering, and of course, art for the World of Warcraft trading card game too. Altogether, they produced a staggering 138 original pieces for the Warcraft TCG, and their work can be found in all aspects of Hearthstone too. In Naxxramas, they are responsible for Kel'Thuzad's hero power and one of the Four Horsemen's spells. Their art has been used in staff credit cards, cards that cannot be obtained normally, such as two of Ysera's dream cards and 17 standard cards. Argent Squire, Fel Reaver, Gorhal, and of course, Ronin, to name just a few. A lot of what I'm going to cover here has already been covered in our Kel'Thuzad episode. So, click the annotation to jump straight to Ronin's story. Ronin belongs to an organisation of mages called the Kirin Tor. Their formation started approximately 2,800 years ago, during the Troll Wars. These wars were fought between the High Elves and the Armani Forest Trolls, a conflict that the Elves were on the verge of losing. Luckily for the Elves, the humans of Azeroth had recently united under a single banner to form the Kingdom of Arathor. The humans had once been made up of a series of different tribes, many of which had experienced firsthand the cruelty of the Trolls. Chieftain Thoradin of the Arathi tribe saw that the Trolls, once finished with their arch enemies the Elves, would eradicate all threats to their dominance, including the human tribes. Thoradin set about uniting the tribes to form Arathor. Using a mixture of diplomacy and force, he founded the city of Strom. With the humans united, the elves saw that they could make for powerful allies against the trolls. King Anastarian sent out diplomats to Strom to negotiate a possible alliance with the humans, a pivotal moment for the elves, who were now on borrowed time. Despite the fact the elves had on occasions treated the humans no better than the trolls had, Thoradin was no fool. Without the Elves, the Trolls would be far more powerful than any other empire on the continent of the Eastern Kingdoms. Their tyranny would go unchecked, slaughtering all that even posed a minor resistance. While the Elves could also be cruel and aloof, looking down on lesser races, they often kept themselves to themselves, content with what they had, not hungry to conquer. With this in mind, Thoradin agreed to an alliance with the Elves. To thank the humans for their aid, the Elves taught 100 of them the art of the Arcane. Having never used magic before, the humans stumbled over their first steps into this new experience. But in a relatively short amount of time, the Elves discovered that these beings that they thought so primitive actually had an affinity for magic. With the humans now possessing enough skill to wield magic in battle, and the military might of Strom backing up the Elves' own forces, it was time for the final encounter with the Trolls upon the Alterac Mountains. After several days of non-stop battle, the humans and Elves were able to win out, the new mages playing a key role in their victory. After the war, the humans returned to their city of Strom, but over time, the mages found the city's wariness of magic and limited resources a burden to their studies. They wished to research and discover more about their new fantastical abilities. They left the city of Strom and founded their own city-state, Dalaran. This started a chain reaction of others leaving Strom to found their own kingdoms, and after a time, the kingdom was no more. Their research unchecked, the mages pushed the boundaries of what they were able to achieve. They built up the enchanted spires of Dalaran, 
mages came from far and wide to join this haven, and others who could tolerate mages found further opportunity. They were able to make the relatively small city into an economic powerhouse. With the magical defenders of Dalaran, they were able to strike up some favourable deals. Dalaran became an opulent paradise. The mages' unchecked use of magic had consequences. The elves hid their use of the arcane using a magical barrier, so that they did not attract the attention of the Burning Legion, a demonic force drawn to Azeroth by use of the arcane, whose first invasion of the world had only just been repelled. Unhidden, the humans' use of magic was drawing the Legion's agents once again to the planet, making their way there through rips in reality. Taken by surprise and confused by this new demonic threat, the humans sought the counsel of the elves. The elves informed the Majorcrats, who ruled Dalaran, that the way to prevent demonic invasion completely would be to give up magic. Having dedicated their lives to magic, the Majorcrats weren't ready to abandon it, so worked out some defence measures with the elves. One was the Order of Tirith's Fall, which gave birth to the Guardians, which you can find out more about in our Medivh episode. Another order born round this time was the Kirin Tor, whose responsibility was to research and catalogue all human magic. This order would later replace the Major Krats as the governing body of Dalaran. Despite these safeguards implemented by the humans and the elves, the Burning Legion once again had their eyes locked on Azeroth. Several decades in the past, the Orcs of Draenor came through the Dark Portal to invade Azeroth. Unbeknownst to Azeroth's denizens, these green-skinned brutes were to act as a preliminary force for the Legion, weakening Azeroth for a full-scale invasion. The first war was fought between the Orcs and the Kingdom of Stormwind, it wasn't until the Second War that the Kirin Tor viewed the Orcs as a very real threat. King Terranus approached Dalaran and many other kingdoms to form an alliance to stand against the Orcs, and it did not take much to convince the mages to join the war effort. The mages were so effective during the early stages of the war that the Orc warlock Gul'dan created Death Knights to counter them dead bodies containing the souls of powerful orcish warlocks. These warlocks have been slaughtered by the new warchief, Orgrim Doomhammer, in an attempt to remove the demonic corruption from the Horde. It is during the Second War that Ronin Redhair's tale begins. Ronin was a young mage that brimmed with talent for the arcane arts. Despite his talents, Ronin had several character flaws. He was arrogant, hot-headed and quick to act rather than think. This reckless attitude would see him disgraced in the eyes of the Kirin Tor. Ronin and several colleagues were sent on a mission by the Kirin Tor to take out a band of Orcish Warlocks. When it became apparent that these Warlocks were in fact trying to resurrect a demon, Ronin hastily prepared a powerful spell. As the battle broke out between the Orcs and the Alliance, they all found themselves in the path of Ronin's spell. When it was unleashed, Ronin succeeded in stopping the Orcs, but he also killed all his companions. The headstrong Ronin would always hide how much he regretted this action and the guilt he felt for taking his companions' lives. Furious with Ronin's negligence, the leaders of the Kirin Tor suspended him from service. Ronin became a pariah, with anyone suggesting that he may be suitable for a job immediately being shut down. Ronin had not been entirely excommunicated, though he would spend a majority of the Second War with his wings clipped. The Second War came to an end with the Alliance claiming victory over the Orcish Horde. Despite a brief period of peace, it was not long until the Council of Six, the heads of the Kirin Tor, began to hear disturbing reports. The Six met to discuss what should be done, their identities remained hidden under cows. While the Orcs had been routed and many of their race placed in internment camps, a few pockets of resistance remained. One of the Orcish clans posing the most resistance were the Dragonmoor, based in the region of Karsmadan. These orcs have been able to capture the Red Dragon Queen, Alex Straza, and force her to produce eggs. The young dragons that hatched 
were raised to become terrifying mounts for the orcs. Reports had come in of interesting activity happening around Karsmadan. Though this was not news, as the orcs always looked to make themselves a thorn in the side of the Alliance. One of the council brought up a more disturbing report, the possible return of Deathwing. It had been believed that the aspect of death had met his end in combat with the mages of Dalaran at the tail end of the Second War. The dragon had been battered by a hail of arcane energy and fallen into the sea. Deathwing's arch enemy was Alex Straza, before she had been restrained by the orcs. Two corpses of red dragons had been found, utterly torn to shreds, no doubt by something larger than themselves. It stood to reason this could be Deathwing, as there was no corpse found after his defeat. There was a more pressing matter for the mages than the orcs and the possible return of Deathwing, squabbling among the alliance over the kingdom of Alterac. The kingdom had been left leaderless after its ruler, Aiden Perinold, had betrayed the alliance as he feared the orcs would win the war. When Perinold's treachery had been discovered, martial law was quickly imposed upon his people, and now with the orcs defeated, arguments had arisen as to who should control Alterac. The debate had become even more heated, with the leader of Gilneas, Sken Greymane, now also wishing to claim the kingdom for his own. It took almost all the Kirin Tor's agents to help King Terranus maintain his leadership of the Alliance. The Council knew that leaving Karsmadan unobserved meant that greater threats could come to fruition, but they were unable to spare anyone with the political unrest surrounding Alterac. One of the six stepped forward with a suggestion. There is Ronin. The rest of the five were not sold on this idea. After his last debacle, he isn't even fit to wear the robes of a wizard. He's more a danger than a hope. The others also chimed in, labelling Ronin unstable, untrustworthy, a maverick, and a criminal. Despite this, the other mage continued. Ronin was the only skilled mage they could spare. On a mission of observation to Kars Madan, surely there was nothing he could do to endanger anyone else. Reluctantly, the council agreed, though one of them couldn't help but have one last jab at Ronin. Perhaps if we are fortunate, Deathwing will swallow Ronin, then choke to death. The mysterious mage, going by the name of Crassus, had actually been conversing with Ronin for some time, and planned from the start to have him elected for this observation mission. Only he had grander plans than the rest of the Kirin Tor. Ronin was not just being sent to observe the orcs, his mission was to free Alex Straza. Ronin took several days to prepare for his mission, collecting together supplies. These preparations made him three days late for meeting with his ranger companion that would escort him to the port of Hazek, Verisa Windrunner, sister of Sylvanas and Illyria. This was not a great start to their partnership, the elf finding the human selfish and arrogant, not even apologising for his late arrival. Ronin wanted to waste yet more time by resting in an inn before departing, but with some commanding words from Verisa, he agreed to begin their journey straight away. The pair journeyed almost completely in silence for four days, until they heard a low rumbling, followed by another. Verisa turned in her saddle and leapt at Ronin, knocking the mage out of his just in time, before a dragon swooped down and gripped their two mounts in its powerful claws. Ronin looked on in despair as his carefully chosen and expensive supplies that had taken him days to assemble were carried away by the dragon. He did not have long to mourn as the dragon turned on him and Verisa for another attack, orders being barked to it from its orcish rider. Ronin and Verisa initially tried to run, but the dragon, with its affinity for magic, was able to keep a lock on Ronin. As the dragon drew closer and closer to Ronin, Verisa made a desperate bid for the beast's attention, throwing a rock into the side of its head. A desperate bid that worked. Dragons are intelligent beasts, but since the orcish mounts were reared from birth as beasts of war, their intelligence was highly undeveloped. While Verisa had attracted attention away from Ronin, it meant that the elf 
was now on the dragon's menu. Ronin did not forsake his guide and repaid her in kind. As the dragon went to strike, it stopped. A spell cast upon it, causing it to uncontrollably itch. Though Ronin would later reveal this was not his original intent, it worked. The dragon thrashed around so much, its orcish rider fell to his death, and when it recovered, it was met by new opponents, dwarven griffin riders. Ronin and Verisa used this opportunity to slip away, but were now mountless with only a few days to reach their destination on time. Luckily for them, or in Ronin's eyes, unluckily, they were discovered by paladins of the Silver Hand, led by Duncan Centurus. A good portion of the paladins of the Silver Hand, during this period of time at least, regarded wizards as damned souls. Ronin could even remember fighting alongside one during the Second War that believed that wizard's soul went to the same place as a demon's upon death, no matter how good a person the man or woman may be. Centurus and his men treated Ronin with disdain. However, they were a lot more amicable toward Verisa. The paladins took in the two travellers for the night, taking them to their settlement. Centurus said he would escort Verisa and Ronin to the docks come the morning to help the elf achieve her mission, not giving any care to Ronin's task. During the evening meal, Ronin excused himself, growing weary of the paladins doting over Verisa and their leader's ego. While he knew he should have gone to bed, Ronin thought he should try to contact Crassus to inform him of the setback in his mission. When his horse had been carried away, Ronin had also lost several items given to him by Crassus that would aid him in scouting Karsmadan and make communication between them easier. This meant the mage had to improvise. Pulling out a dark gem from his pocket, he began to mutter words of power upon the battlements of the keep. Ronin found open spaces cleared his mind. Ronin stopped mid-spell as he noticed the stars vanish for a split second. Reasoning to himself he was tired, he continued. He was then rudely interrupted by a young paladin, but before Ronin could chastise him, a blast hit the side of the keep, knocking Ronin off his feet and sending the young paladin to his death. A second blast caused rubble to tumble down upon Ronin. The last thing the mage remembered before losing consciousness was being grasped by something akin to a giant hand. The talons of a dragon. The next time Ronin awoke would be in the woodlands near the attacked settlement. Verisa and the paladins had gone out searching for Ronin. The paladins all but certain he had been responsible for the destruction. Confident Ronin had nothing to gain from attacking the keep, Verisa stood by her charge's innocence as they searched. As another night fell, the search party gave up their search for the day, setting up camp. It was at this time a strong gust blew through the camp. After a brief search, they found Ronin, looking pale and exhausted. Ronin was only able to open his eyes long enough to see Verisa's face and mumble, Ranger, how nice to see you again, before passing out. It was not long after waking that Centurus began to question Ronin accusing the mage of the destruction of the keep, as the others from his order had seen him casting a spell before the explosion. Ronin admitted he was casting a spell, but only to communicate with his superior. He was on an important mission for the Alliance. Something that Verisa could vouch for. Someone of her skill would not have been sent to protect him otherwise. Verisa calmly added that she would be willing to fight any of Centurus's paladins to protect Ronin, as confident in his innocence as she was. Swayed by Verisa's faith and not wanting to tussle with a skilled elven ranger, Centurus conceded Ronin's innocence. From Ronin's fragmented memories, they concluded that the most likely culprits were goblins lovers of explosions and chaotic mischief. Ronin did not mention his saviour from death had been a dragon. The next day, the party continued on toward Hazik, but as they approached, they could hear no noise coming from the town. Very odd for even a small port to be so quiet. As Ronin and company drew closer, they could hear the faint sounds of life, putting to rest their suspicion that the port had been levelled, though the reality turned out not to be much better. Before they entered the port, Ronin and company were met by several griffin riders, the same that had intervened when Ronin and Verisa were being chased by the dragon, led by Falstad Dragon Reaver. 
Falstad's actual surname is Wildhammer, like the name of his clan, but he was so proficient at slaying the beasts, he often went by Dragon Reaver. Falstad welcomed the party, wishing to find out why they had made their way to Hazak. When informed it was to find a vessel for Ronin, Falstad told them it may be difficult now. Recently, two dragons had attacked Hazak, though luckily for the small port, the Griffin Riders were in the area and fought a glorious battle against the serpents, winning the day. Upon entering the port, Ronin found that the damage to Hazak was a lot worse than the dwarves had let on, but he was determined to find travel to Karlsmadan. Turning to Varisa, Ronin thanked her for her escort, but to his pleasant surprise, Varisa insisted on staying with him, as her mission was not done until Ronin was on his way to Karlsmadan. The mage was happy about this, as he had grown quite fond of Varisa. What he was less happy about was Duncan's insistence to also stay, more due to his infatuation with Varisa than any wish to help Ronin. To cover more ground in an attempt to find a vessel crazy enough to take Ronin into Dragon Country, the three split up. The more Ronin searched, the more the desperation of his situation revealed itself. The dragons appear to have targeted the ships in the port, burning many to their frames. Those that had been lucky enough to survive the attack had moved on to find safer and more lucrative locations. As Ronin began to despair he may never reach the location of his mission, he noticed the dwarves still flew above Hazak. An idea struck him. Surely, if anyone was crazy enough to take him to Karlsmadan, it would be the dwarves of the Wildhammer clan. Their bravery, and some believe insanity, was legendary. Ronin followed them until they landed. Falstad was nowhere to be seen, so it was the dwarf Moloch that he asked to take him to Karlsmadan. Moloch flat out refused the mage, but Ronin was not to be dissuaded. He kept asking, and Moloch kept refusing. Not through fear of Karlsmadan, but due to his prejudice towards spellcasters. Ronin's insistence meant the proceedings became riotous, making a lot of noise and driving Moloch to lift Ronin off the ground by his collar. Perhaps violence could persuade the mage to go away. Before anything too violent happened, Falstad arrived along with Varisa. Falstad was very much on Moloch's side, but Varisa stood by Ronin. After a rather heated exchange, Varisa convinced Falstad to take her and Ronin to Karlsmadan. Falstad had taken a rather forward and little unwelcome liking to Varisa, so agreed to the almost suicidal transport mission if she came along and rode on the back of his griffin. To Moloch's dismay, Ronin would be riding on his. The party made their way to the inn. After all, the dwarves weren't flying without their griffins rested, and not without having a mug of ale or two. Ronin took Varisa aside, furious. I, and only I, will continue on. You'll be returning with our good friend, Falstad. If you think you are going any further, I'll send you back here myself. Ronin wanted to complete his mission alone. Partially because he felt he worked best alone, but mainly because he didn't want any harm to come to his companions because of him. He did not want any more spectres of his past mistakes to haunt him. When morning came, Ronin was more irritated when he found out Centurus had managed to convince the dwarves to take him along. While Ronin found the paladin annoying, he didn't want anything to befall him either. After Duncan handed over his seal of command to his second, which signified if anything were to happen to him, they would take over as leader of the regiment, the small party was ready to depart. Very soon into his first ride on a griffin, Ronin told himself he would never ride one again. The beast sped across the ocean. The only landmass that lay between the heroes and their destination was Tol Barad. They would not rest here, as the island was stormed by the Horde early on in their invasion and ever since, the island maintained a haunting aura that kept members of the Alliance away out of fear. The Griffins made great time, and after several hours, Karlsmadan was visible on the horizon. But so too were two other specks, moving in on them fast. The two dragon riders that faced the dwarves this time were clearly experienced, and with their Griffins weighed down by their passengers, this would be a truly difficult fight the sort of thing dwarves of the Wildhammer clan relished. 
Ronin instructed Moloch that it was important to get him to his destination rather than fight. But when he saw a dragon bearing down on Varisa, he felt compelled to instruct Moloch back into the fray. Ronin prepared a spell that struck both dragon and rider with a bolt of lightning. This was less effective than Ronin thought it would be, only managing to stun the dragon and rider for a moment. Realising Varisa was now safe, Ronin again, to Moloch's annoyance, instructed the dwarf to the shore. What the two had not noticed was the other dragon coming round to attack. Moloch sought to evade the dragon's swipe, but with Ronin slowing his griffin, the dragon was able to tear at one of Moloch's mount's wings, injuring it, but not knocking it out of the air. As the injured griffin carrying Ronin fled from the dragon, Ronin looked up in horror as Duncan Centurus's griffin edged closer, the paladin standing up on its back. With a mighty leap, Duncan jumped onto the dragon's back. Ronin exclaimed, he must be mad, to which Moloch replied, no wizard, he's a warrior. Duncan edged his way up the dragon's neck, but as he readied his sword to plunge into the dragon's skull, an axe bit into his back. The orc dragon rider sought to put an end to Duncan's plans. As the orc raised his axe for a mortal blow, Ronin reacted quickly. He muttered a spell, causing a brilliant flash of light to appear before the orc. Dazed, the orc fell to his death. In his final moments, Duncan made eye contact with Ronin and silently conveyed to him his respect before plunging his sword into the base of the dragon's skull. Duncan died even before his body fell from the dragon. The dying dragon convulsed in the sky, and as it did, one of its wings hit Moloch and Ronin. The two plummeted toward the ocean. Moloch to his death, but Ronin was saved by a familiar clawed talon, a voice entering his mind. I have you again, little one. Never fear. Never fear. See you next week, guys. Bye-bye.